thing is pretty unique and pretty special. Uh, this the focus is on the journey of Derby rubber based in Australia and the crisis to sustainable growth. So in this session, we have uh, Mr. Michael Clayton, CEO of the Derby Rubber Products Limited, Private Limited, based in Australia. We'll be discussing with him about the the Derby's rubber journey. Uh, before we start the session, uh, let me quickly introduce about Technobiz. Technobiz is based in Thailand, established in 2005, and it is recognized as International Resource Center for Polymer Industries and Technologies. Uh, we have two types of service. One is a professional education, other one is a business services. Professional education, we cover training, master classes, executive diploma, publications, and it's a library. Uh, we have business service on the, the exhibitions, conferences, virtual events, webinars, road shows, and also various consulting, marketing, and branding services. Our industry and technology focus is primarily on polymer industry. When talk, when talk about polymer industry, uh, rubber, plastics, polyurethane, foams, additives and coatings, and also uh, non-polymer side, uh, membranes and filtration, recycling and recovery, nanotechnology, smart manufacturing, and also chemical process. You can always check out about the technologies at technologies.org. If you have any questions, any comments, or anything that you think we can assist you, you can always write to me. You can always welcome you to join the journey of the technologies. Let me quickly brief you about what kind of services we offer for the rubber latex entire industries. Uh, we have an exhibition. I welcome you all to participate in this exhibition, GRT. Um, a must attend event for all the rubber industry professionals, 29th to 31st March in Bangkok, Thailand at the Bitec. This is recognized as a, the gateway to global markets and knowledge hub for rubber latex and tar industries. You can check more information at expo.technology.org. We also have another event in Middle East, Middle East Rubber and Tire Expo, uh, scheduled during the 21st to 22nd November in Sharjah, near to Dubai. That's also a focused event for the Middle East region. At these events, we also focus on the research and patents through the rubber industry. Feel free to join us in, all the, in both uh, events. We have various rubber training programs, rubber industry training, online training, through our know how the webinars project. Uh, we have developed quite a number of uh, programs through the uh, various experts across the world. Uh, they're well experienced and knowledgeable. Uh, they are very resourceful for these programs. We have developed more than 250 tra short training programs, 30 plus master classes, and also three months of diploma program as well. The diploma program is, uh, is the registration of the diploma is, is open now. I encourage you all to join this diploma program, Execute Diploma 360 Degrees, Rubber Industry Technology and Management. It is a three month online program, but it is purely focused on a non tire and latex non-latex industry okay it's a purely solid rubber non-tire rubber industry okay. uh, we also have various books for the rubber industry go to the website store.technology.org if you like to purchase any of the books you're interested uh, we have some pocket books and also some uh, reference books as well and this is our rubber industry news server this is a weekly program and uh, hosted by technobis we also have a latex industry news server that is a fortnightly. It means that once in every two weeks, we have this program too. And another one is a rubber industry connect. It's a marketing platform for the rubber industries. So we offer through the digital marketing uh, for both the technologies as well as the rubber product manufacturers. And currently we're working on the digital library, rubber industry digital library. It will be available very soon. Um, if, if you would like to add your papers, if you if you have any literature that you'd like to in, include in this library, uh, go to the library.technology.org, join as a member and upload your data in this month. Okay, and um, other consult services we have, technical, marketing, branding, these are the services we offer. That's about the Technobase. You can always check our website, uh, technobase.org. To the uh, rubber industry news server episode number 49 as i mentioned to you before uh, this episode is very special uh, because we are going to discuss learn about the journey of the derby rubber uh, based in australia uh, 
basically the subject is on the crisis to sustainable growth. Um, basically this company experienced a really turbulent times a couple of years ago, but they did very well in the last in the four years time back on the food and now on the in growth in sustainable growth so it's a very interesting inspiring journey of uh, there be rubber i think all the rubber industries should understand should and listen to this uh, session or participate in this session uh, and see how they made it happen and uh, that is you know uh, Thing that we want to know from this uh, session i'm pleased to you know have in uh, mr uh, michael clayton ceo of the there be rubber products based in australia to tell us about his experience he uh, what happened how it happened or what he did how he managed it how he made same changes and so uh, it's it's uh, we have michael clayton here and we learn about all the things what happened with derby rubber how he really changed the direction of the derby rubber into from the crisis to the sustainable growth um so michael thank you very much uh, for accepting this you know invitation today and uh, being part of the rubber industry news server i'm um, actually i want to tell you i want to do, do the story very long ago i'm glad that i got a chance to meet you in uh, in uh, bangalore and so so I'm, thank you for accepting the invitation i appreciate that thank you my pleasure yeah so the plan is like this first we want audience to understand uh, what is that be rubber what kind of products uh, you produce so that you get a picture of them your profile and background so um, i do invite you to give a short presentation first uh, on the uh, there be rubber okay let me ask you to share your screen Okay, so a little bit of background on um, on Derby Rubber, the, the title of the presentation from crisis to sustainable growth and it's a great opportunity to to talk to you um, about the, a, a business recovery I suppose and about a, a resilient business as well. So some background as to who Derby Rubber is. Um, Look, we manufacture extruded rubber parts, hand-built parts, molded parts as well, and specifically around these particular areas. So abrasion resistance, so our, our materials and our products are installed into aggressive um, or very demanding applications, um, seals and gaskets, so transportation seals, weather seals, industrial gaskets, vibration and impact, and compound design. I guess no surprises for any rubber business around what those applications are. Um, compound design is very special to us as it is to many uh, rubber technology companies as well. So we have in-house expertise around product design, material selection, compound design, uh, compound development and testing as well. And a lot of our business relies quite heavily on compound design. We're operating in such a competitive environment that being able to design your own compounds and continuously improve those does give you a performance edge on your competitors. With our certifications, we've held quality certification of ISO 9001 for 30 years now, and we've also added uh, ISO 14001, the environmental certification. So who is Derby Rubber? Well, our purpose is we create resilient products so that you can go the distance. We're an advanced manufacturer of rubber products and we've been around since 1964. We're a second generation family owned business. And the photo of a half built Sydney Opera House is there because one of the first projects that we completed were the window seals on the Sydney Opera House when it was being built, as well as some, uh, some seals in the Snowy Hydro scheme as well. So we're a business that spent 55 years uh, based in Sydney. Our core values, and these are values that have been crafted by all the people within Derby Rubber. Um, they are, we say it, we do it, we own it. We succeed when our customers succeed. We change the game and we win together. Now we use these to, to hire people, to recognize people who go above and beyond with the values in our business, um, how to choose what we want to do and what we don't want to do within the business and who we want to deal with. So that, and they really are at the core of our culture and values are so important, I think, for any successful business. We export and we're very uh, fluent at exporting and two products that we export a lot of are 
our ballast regulated room element. So there's a, a ballast regulated machine in the top left and just under it is the broom spindle that sits uh, on the ballast regulator for sweeping track. It's used to shape and distribute the ballast on a rail track and Derby Rubber is the world leader in designing and manufacturing uh, ballast regulated broom elements. And the other one is traffic counter tube and you may be familiar with the two tubes of rubber that are laid across a road or a bicycle path as we do in the Netherlands and it counts and classifies traffic and uh, it's very um, durable of course being in the application that it is and it's going to be very um, responsive as well to be able to measure all the axles that are going across it. So those are our main exports. We've been exporting for over 25 years typically to the USA, to Europe and throughout the Asia Pacific. Um, we've exported into India, Thailand, Malaysia, China, right over to Kazakhstan. Um, and we've operated a European distribution office and warehouse in the Netherlands for the last 20 years as well. So now touching on the markets, and I've mentioned the rail track broom elements already, as well as the traffic counter tubes, but we're quite a diverse business. I think that's very important. We'll touch on that later today as well. So other industries we service are rail rolling stocks, that's doors and window sills and trains and trams throughout the Australian network, mining and very aggressive and high wearing applications within mining, chute linings and the like. Um, defence as well, so defence applications around vibration, around impact, um, around ceiling, um, infrastructure, a lot of infrastructure projects, um, particularly some marine fender systems, no dig, which is trenchless pipe repair systems using um, inflatable bladders to repair underground sewer pipes without having to excavate and agriculture as well. So suspension components and other components within agricultural tillage equipment. So quite a diverse business. Sustainability is very important to Derby Rubber and I think it should be very important to, to all businesses as well. And we have a three pillared approach to sustainability within the business. The first one is about sustainable product design. So ensuring that we're designing a product and that's the shape of the product and the compound of the product is designed to be the longest lasting in the market. We're not interested in a race to the lowest price and designing a compound that is going to fail quickly in the market. We're designing for, um, for a long-term value and that's really important to us around the sustainability of our products. For example, our rail track products, um, our elastic range, our broom elements um, have a wear life improvement of between sort of 60 to 400% on our competitors. We also sponsor um, and have sponsored a three-year postdoctoral research project with the University of Queensland um, around really niche materials to be incorporated into rubber compounds, nanofillers and the like, um, to then impart additional engineering properties onto that to make our parts either perform better or last longer or both in the market. The second pillar is around sustainable work environment. So making sure that we've got an environment that our workers want to come to every day. So that improves their well-being at work. It, giving, it promotes a safe work environment. It's clean, it's tidy, um, and investing in their skill development and their training as well. So that's around sustainable jobs within the business. And the final one is sustainable business practices. And that's the one that most people think about when they think about sustainability. They think about uh, energy usage. So yes, we've got solar panels on our roof and we're very privileged here in the, in the state of South Australia in Australia that um, uh, probably about 70% of our power grid here is based on renewables like uh, wind and solar. Um, we've also got special uh, PLCs on some of our equipment that allow us to have on demand for say our cooling towers and other applications within the business. So we're saving power, we're saving water. Um, and then when it comes down to waste, we're recycling a lot. Only 5% of the waste that we generate on site within the plant here is directed to landfill. And then finally around um, digitising our systems, going from paper-based into digital systems, so meaning that you know, less, less printing. And continuing on from that, I suppose innovation and R&D, and that's one of the pillars of our business. It, it's keeping us improving our products and improving our systems and our processes as well. So some of the current projects that we're working on at the moment, and Industry 4 is very um, very close to my heart as well. The digitalization of, of our processes, 
the gathering of data off the shop floor. Um, and I think we're going to touch on that um, tonight as well. Um, we're also developing new products that have improved life. That, you know, talked about continuously improving our, our compounds to continue to deliver additional wear life. We have the sustainability program that we're continuing to develop, which I just touched on, and then continuing to um, develop those new materials, whether they're developing in-house or with local universities as well. So that's uh, that's a real background, brief background to to Derby Rubber. I guess it sort of lays the foundations for what you you want to cover in today's presentation. Thank you, Michael. It's good to know about all the things happening at the there'll be rubber. Fantastic. Thank you very much. It's a good presentation and you have given already a lot of ideas also how to sustain the practices, sustain the environment, working environment and uh, yeah, I think you know what you guys are doing is uh, is uh, learning for the many other rubber industries in particular in Asia, I would say. Yeah. So, um, Michael, you know, uh, before I go into the main theme of what we are here for today, um, I want to understand your background first, you know, um, you've been with the Derby for the last seven years, is that um, correctly? Yeah. And uh, so, but you've been working with the rubber industry for a long time. Can you talk about your experience with the rubber industry when you started it? You know, what's your education background? How you get into the rubber? Yeah, please. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. So I've been in the rubber industry for 20 years now. Um, and we've got a few things in, in common room. So not only are we wearing identical shirts, but we also have identical backgrounds. Uh, I, I too am a chemical engineer. Um, yeah, that was my education. Um, I studied here um at the university of adelaide uh which is where in adelaide which is, is where derby rubber is now um and then after graduating you know at that time it was all about oil and gas jobs in oil and gas um you know that's what every chemical engineer was aspiring to be it's probably similar to you as well and uh and that's where all the jobs were as well and look i, I didn't pursue that um i did some did some background work and uh some of my vacation work in the oil and gas fields um working out in the 50 degree heat in the middle of the deserts and, and all that look wasn't really for me um <laughs> as i went on to polymer research okay. and i moved up to uh queensland so brisbane in queensland and uh, at the University of Queensland, and then I, I was working in polymers, uh, biodegradable polymers, so polylactic acid. Um, and then, um, and then, yeah, I, I fell into the rubber industry. I think as, as anyone does, um, you know, they they do kind of fall into the rubber industry. And and for me, it was um, I love I love rubber because with an engineering background, your know, rubber rubber spans all industries. And so as an engineer, I can. I can talk with, you know, you saw how diverse Derby Rubber is. You know, we're talking with agriculture, we're mining, then we're in defence, we're in rail, we're in infrastructure, and I'm talking with, um, you know, the business owners and the managing directors right down to the people running machines as well. And uh, so I really love that diversity and the diversity of, of rubber and being able to solve problems, so to develop products, to develop compounds, to, to solve problems. So I started in the, in the rubber industry 20 years ago, um, in rubber chemistry, moving into, into being a technical manager, and um, and then I moved to Sydney and uh, started with Derby Rubber. Um, yeah, almost eight years ago now, and um, in a in a general management role, and then into the CEO's role as well. So so leading the leading the business. Fantastic. So. So you had a good journey and entered into the rubber. So once the rubber got stick into you never get out of the rubber industry. That's how people It's like that, isn't it? Yeah, people stay <laughs> for life. Yeah, you stay for life. Yeah, that's what it is. Yeah. Uh, let's little bit on to the now. There be rubber. You know, you are producing a customized products um, uh, and so you have very variety of applications. Um, which market is uh, strong for you? Yes, yeah, so, uh, the the rail market is very strong for us. So yeah, ballast regulated broom elements is, is a very strong market for us. Um, I think it's important with the diversity that we've got, we've got products that we take to market in our own right and we develop in house. And then on the other side of the business, we are a jobbing company as well. So, you know, we do respond to those people who say, you know, here's a drawing, 
can you can you make this as well? And do you have your own molding shop as well, or you yes. outsource? Yeah, oh, okay. So that makes it easy as well. So you can customize the customer needs. Yeah. So yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's get into the you know the purpose of our discussion today is a crisis at uh, mm. Derby Rubber. I know it's a, I may touch I may take you back you know for four years I think it's on the February 2019 and I understand uh, it's a hard times um, mm. but I like to I want the people to understand how you, you guys you know survived and moved forward you know make for, forward steps in this one so what really happened in February yeah, 2019 so, yeah yeah so I do remember the date very well um, yeah you know it was a Sunday night, the 17th of February, February 2019. Um, look, two days prior, it was just business as usual on that Friday. Um, in fact, we had a business owner um, on site and we were sitting in the boardroom developing the, the business strategy for the year ahead as well and talking about the future. Um, so that was on the Friday. And then, um, yeah, Sunday, late Sunday night, I got a phone call um, and attended site about 11 p.m. on a Sunday night. And it was very clear that we we didn't have a have a factory anymore. Um, the firefighters had, had just got the fire under control, um, but it was clear how much damage there was. The building was a was a complete write off, and uh, we were unsure as to what the status was of anything that was inside the building at that point in time. Um, so yeah, you know, all that was going through my mind at that point in time was. You know, I'm, there's no jobs for the guys when they, you know, when they're clocking on in seven hours time, there's there's nothing here for them. We have to get in contact with them. Um, and um, yeah, straight away, it was just like, let's work out what the damage is and let's just get going again. You know, um, that's always been my attitude in, in times of crisis. And, and that's, I think, the biggest point of crisis in my life. And, and yeah, it certainly wasn't any different. Um, Look, as far as the fire goes, it was it was clearly an arson attack, um, and the the investigation a year later concluded it was an arson attack, a uh, very deliberate fire, you know, late on a Sunday night, a break and enter, and and a lot of accelerant spotted around the, the factory. So, look, it was very deliberate, and it was clearly aimed to cause uh, disruption to the business. Um, so, look, that that first week. Um, you know, we put all of our put all of our employees on on full pay at home um, until we worked out what the status was. And that first week is just about the investigation. So the fire investigation, the police investigation, uh, what's even worse, you know, the insurance investigations. And uh, and that was the toughest interview. And um, and for us in the business, it was about okay, what what's the extent of the damage? And it was significant. Um, you know, we lost we lost all of our dispatch area we lost all of our stock uh, finished stock raw materials end of belt line was gone packaging gone archive rooms gone <clears throat> and then it was well we think the main plant we think the extrusion and the order clouds are, are okay but we can't tell we've got no power um, and um, to get the, the fire under control was a lot of water so there's a lot of water damage as well mm -hmm. So yeah, that was the first week. The second week was building on that recovery. So in our mind, it was just about let's grab that plant and let's get it under someone's roof, another another rubber company's roof, and let's just get going again as quickly as we can. Um, so that was the, the mind mind about you know recovery of the business and just fulfilling orders. And um, and so we knew of companies that had uh, floor space available who had asked us, you know, if we wanted to to move in at points in time. So we we ran to them and uh, and found very quickly that those sort of crisis management plans that we we had but we didn't had um, were actually obsolete, and we didn't have anywhere to take our plant. And when you've got IP wrapped up in your products and your processes. You don't want to go to your competitors and knock on their doors and, and start getting getting underway with production there. So those are those first couple of weeks, and it got to the end of the second week, and I, I said to the business owner because we were both quite we were, we were worn out and quite depressed at that point in time, and I just said I know why I know why businesses when they have something like this just call it a day and just close the doors and say you know well we're done and. Um, 
And so it really was a low point. Um, so it was that point that I said to the business owner, what, what do you want to do? You know, we'll, I want to rebuild. I want to get going again. And he said, yeah, I want to do the same. So, well, your team needs to hear that. And then the team needs to tell you that they've got your back as well. And we had that meeting. We had it at the Pullman in, um, in Sydney Olympic Park. And the management team came together and we said that to each other. And you know, it was a sight of you know, sense of relief. And that was the that was the turning point. From that point on, we ran went around the table and we said, all right, you're looking after decommissioning of the plant, you're looking for a new site, you're doing this. We just divided up the jobs. Um, and you know, to be honest, that was the last time that we all sat together. Um, we haven't all sat together, and that's almost four years ago now. Um, and the next time that we'll see each other. Um, is the the day of this um, of this broadcast as well. So it'd be great to see all the team and have them together. And of course, we had COVID in the middle that sort of upset all those plans. Um, so yeah, that was that was it. The other critical part was that the business was planning to relocate, and we were in a very old site, and we couldn't be efficient in our processes, and we needed to get off of this part that had walls in the middle of the factory, and it had stepped floors and we and we were tight and we had forklift traffic intermingled with pedestrian traffic so we we're looking at relocating and one of the places we we're looking at relocating to was adelaide and so we just said let's let's just pack up and run to adelaide now let's not try and get going again in sydney let's just run now um so yeah that's what we did we we decommissioned our site we split up the split up our management team sent people to adelaide found an empty warehouse and um, yeah, just started to move plants and connect it all up and and um, hire new staff. And uh, look, it was it was three and a half months, and and we were back in production and, and exporting wow. again. So really, really quick turnaround. It, it also shows the the strong mind of your management. It is, as you said, uh, the RBW is a family owned business, and uh, it's a, it's a 50, 50 plus years of uh, established years. It's, yes. It means very much attached to it, you know. And uh, uh, may I ask, you know, I know it's hard. The day it happened, uh, what was the mindset of the owners? I'm sure it's, uh, yeah, you know, what you guys talked about. You know, hey, uh, there's not, nothing in your control, okay? You yeah, guys were standing yeah. outside of the building and let it burn, you know. You cannot go inside. You can't take any. Glad that nobody there, you know, no physical or you know, human being, you know, workers are not there. It's a holiday for you and you know, Sunday is yeah, a holiday. Yeah, yes. I mean, that was, that was, you know, really comforting was it? It was on a Sunday night, so there was nobody on site. Yeah, so there were no injuries. Uh, look, yeah, it's devastating. And, and when the business has been there for 55 years, and um and you know people who'd worked in the business had been there for 30 years some of them um yeah to see that and fires are messy you know it's not like just a someone comes in and steals some things and leaves everything else untouched everything is a mess um there's so much water damage and 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 soot and you know building and you're everything's then exposed to the elements and yeah it, it makes a makes an absolute mess okay now can you talk about the the mindset of your owner you know mm. what he he was thinking at that time you know and uh, uh what kind of interaction yes you are the manager general manager ceo of the company and the mm. owners are there and you uh, i think that is a situation in uh, it's hard to explain you know but uh what kind of discussion you guys had at time you know? mm. yeah yeah so it was it really was as i as i outlined you know the first couple of weeks it was just about let's just get going as quickly as can Let's grab a machine, chuck it in someone's shed, and let's just get going again. Um, but it, yeah, it was at the end of those two weeks. So we could, it was, it, we weren't saying anything, but we could just see from each other's faces that you know we were spent, we were absolutely spent, and and we needed to make a, a very quick and clear decision as to what the the future of the business was going to be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a, that's a tough. And you talk about investigations, you know, this, uh, that is also, well, every company got insured. Okay. Uh, so what's your experience? I, I think it's very important to get insured. Some companies, they don't mm -hmm. do it. And can you talk about importance of the insurance 
of the yeah. facilities, equipment, and um, uh, how much you is it is it completely insured? Even if it's insured, uh, whether you get money in time to invest it back yeah, or sure. not, or that is also a big challenge, I guess. Is it? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So it's saved. It's like insurance saved us, but also it almost destroyed us too. So look, yeah, we've been insured you know, for 55 years and barely had any or any a couple of minor claims, I think, but nothing substantial in there. So when you're faced with a full loss, and it's not just um, business loss, um, so you've got business continuity insurance in there as well that kicks in to you know, protect your profits. Um, but you've got a complete building loss. You've got stock loss. You've got machine loss. You've got machine damage. So it adds up very, very quickly. And it's millions and millions of dollars. Um, so yeah, you've got business continuity insurance that can kick in pretty quickly to you know, keep your profit coming in. But um, yeah, what we found was that, and I guess one of the big learnings was this, was to review your insurance every year. So, and make sure you're, it's, it's up to date, um, that you know, you're insuring, you've got new plant insured, you've got, you're insured to the right quantities, um, you know, you're keeping that constant touch point on your insurance every year. Um, and then also that you've got someone in there, you've got it built into your insurance that it'll pay for someone to come in and negotiate your insurance for you as well. Um, because that was something that was very complex for us. And we didn't settle our insurance for more than two years down the track uh, for some of the major claims. And if we didn't have very deep pockets, we would have gone under. Oh. And uh, your company, you know, how do you manage the financing immediately? You know, of course, you've got support from your customers. Okay. And I think uh, uh, you know, everything is lost. All the material is gone. Stock is gone. So um, how do you manage, uh, you know, in terms of you need money to invest back? Yeah. The back and forth is not somebody, you know, give you the open the door and come and do it. And you have to spend the money, even the moving out whatever available from logistics are there. So how do you guys manage the, you know, yeah. in, uh, in terms of finance aspect of it? Yeah, we, we just burn through cash um, over over a number of months. So yeah, not only you've got the, the losses you, you, you talked about, but yes, you've got, um, we're setting up a new facility. And so, you know, we've got a fit out of a brand new facility as well. Uh, and that's not cheap. You know, the, when you start talking presses, extruders, autoclaves, there's a lot of cabling, there's a lot of pipe work. Um, so there's a lot that goes into fitting out a building. So look, we, we had a lot of cash put away because we were planning on relocating. So we were saved. So that did save us and, and get us through. But you know, it was, yeah, it was getting pretty critical towards the end. Uh, Mano, what was the reason that you guys wanted to relocate from Sydney to uh, South Australia side? Yeah, what was the yeah. reason? Yeah, because cost is expensive in the running the business in the Sydney. Yeah, yeah, that's one of the reasons. Um, Sydney is a very expensive city to do business in. Um, look, there was a there's a bit of a hole, a gap in the market in Adelaide as well that we could fit quite nicely into. Um, mm -hmm. We export. Um, a lot, you know, 40% of the business is export, so I don't need to be in Sydney for that part of the business. Um, we're doing a lot of work over in Western Australia as well, so we just sort of just centralised the business. Um, and also South Australia is a is quite a strong manufacturing hub as well. It's always had strong manufacturing roots, so we want to pick pick up on some really good people as well yeah. uh, to build yeah. a strong new manufacturing team. Mm -hmm. And um... You know, when the, this crisis happened, uh, you you guys have to talk to your customers, right? You know, you must have the delivery deadlines and things like that. You know, what kind of feedback you got from your customers? Yeah. So yeah, customers had to have those tough phone calls in the in the first few days. And look, customers were, um, yeah, they were quite emotional with us. Um, sorry for what had happened. Um, you know, sort of a month in, they're still quite understanding. Um, two months in, still a little bit understanding, but they're starting to put the pressure on as to, you know, when you're going to be back in operation, give us an update. And then after about three months, yeah, it's critical. They're really putting the pressure on you as to when you're, you know, when are you going to be back in production? And, uh, you know, we were three and a half months. Um, and so, you know, it was, it was really, I think if we were going to be a couple of weeks later than that, we would have lost customers. Um, but as we 
we, we structured our, our production as well for when we came online that we were able to not say, well, we're not fulfilling full orders, but we just started trickle feed and get our customers back up and moving again. And really juggle production works for long hours in order to, to get that up. But look, one of the learnings that I had um, out of this and the biggest learning I think was about communication. And there's a, there's a company in South Australia here called Thomas Foods and I, I went to a presentation from one of the directors of Thomas Foods and, and they had a complete loss with a fire as well of their, of their plant. And the owner was on Twitter or on LinkedIn every single day um, just putting out an update. And if I could have my time again, I, I'd just do communication. Like it would just be, you know, we were so, so head down and focused on getting the business up and running again and getting a new plant set up that we, we, we should have put more time into a daily update. And, and the gap of that communication was filled by competitors. So we had pe competitors sort of circling around us like sharks and, and phoning up our customers and saying, oh, no, you haven't heard from them. Well, that's because they've gone under. Haven't you heard the news that they've gone under? We'll take your business. So look, communication was something I would have done so much better. Um, and I think the other thing that I would have done as well is to have another leader in the business as well, because we had strong leadership within the business, but we we're all so focused on the recovery and, and on those aspects that we were working on in recovery that we really needed someone above us just to be looking down over us and just you know guiding us if we needed to or looking after our mental health or you know just that that side of it as well just to make sure that overall we're all okay mm -hmm. yeah that's you know people take advantage of situation i think that you know i totally understandable that you have priorities you know how to get it going first you know and uh, well, people in the competitor, competitors take any situation advantage in their own way, you know, taking out your client base as well. Yeah. Um, one yeah, one look, important. Yeah, yeah, go on. I was going to say that just one, one last comment on the customers was we put out a video um, on one of the anniversaries of the fire. And I, I walked through the factory and talked about the fire. And, um, and one of my top customers uh, phoned me after that. And uh, someone who was really putting some some serious pressure on me as well. And they were our first they were our first shipment out of the out of the factory once we got going. And he just apologized and just said, look, I actually, you know, we were so caught up in watching our stock levels dwindle as well and having to talk to our customers that yeah, we forgot about well, we didn't realise the depth of what you were all going through. And just, you know, just want to say sorry for you know what we put you through. And you know, just want to you know, congratulate you on 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 what you did to to look after us in that time. And yeah, that got that was quite emotional for me to to hear that. Because yeah, we don't, we yeah. shared those moments, but from from different perspectives. Yeah, yeah. You know, sometimes they also they look in their own angle. Yeah, they want their products to be delivered. They maybe they have their own issues of you know utilizing their product. So. Yeah, you know, one one thing I always, when this kind of crisis is that keeping the moral of the employees in up, you know, keep intact and uh, put them in the right track. Hey, we are going to be all right, you know, or, you know, you know even you say immediately, you know, three months, you don't know what is going. They also, they, they worry about uh, their own uh, uh, family, you know, issues also there. So how do you guys keep, maintain the moral of the, uh, the staff, you know, keep intact mm -hmm. and uh, keep them together and all in the right direction, try to get in, get it done in three months time on, you know, yeah. Yeah, it's a tough one. And look, there was that initial meeting where we said, yep, we're, get, we're all gonna do this together. And I think it's, it was, um, it was the strongest team that I've ever been a part of, I think was because we had that, um, we had that goal you know, the flag was clearly placed as to where we wanted to go, what that finish line was, and that's get back in business um, in Adelaide. We all had that sense of purpose. So we're all driven by that sense of purpose as well, which made this, the team very, very strong. But you're right. You know, you're thinking about your livelihood as well. Um, and yeah, I had people who were, were job searching through that time as well. I didn't know at the time, but you know, they, were, they were looking elsewhere. Um, but yeah, I think that solid belief in that common purpose um, got us through that. And you know, once once we 
could see that you know, the machines weren't damaged. Um, I was taking photos at the new site and sending that to people who were still back at the Sydney site as well, just showing them, you know, here's the new factory and here's product. You know, photos of the, the product that's coming off the belt line, the first products and you know, the first first container that we're filling up and all of that. So, yeah, about just having that connection to the plant as well, because we were a split team at that point in time too. So we were in Sydney and Adelaide at, the, at that moment. So, um, yeah, I think just about, about that. You know, we had good... I guess that's, you know, we had great communication inside the team and we went to, from that crisis moment, we went to daily meetings. So every every single morning, the management team would come together um, on a Teams call and, and all give our updates. And we did that every single day. And we've only just recently dropped that, um, probably about six months ago, we just dropped back to sort of once or twice a week now. But up until that point, every single day we had a management meeting. Um, just to, to get us through that. Yeah, that's very, that's very important. I think the kudos to your employees too, because they are together. You know, you need their help to, you know, get it done, you know, get move on, right? So, yeah, so fantastic. Um, so how is, did you ever been to that uh, again? Uh, look at that, the past plan and pass by uh, what situation right now that the old uh, will be planned. What's our plan now? No, no, the, the old old that we planned, the one which was uh, got under, into the fire, is anything happening there now? Is it belong oh, to the you, your family? Yeah. Yeah, the old yeah the old site's going to be. Uh, well, actually, at, at the moment, the the excavator is probably going through it, through it right now, knocking it down. So I think it's getting demolished over this week and next week. Um, and as for the future plans, but I'm not sure. But um, yeah, it's stood, it's stood there for a while. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And um, if I want to touch a little bit again about insurance aspects of it. You know, did you get all the money? You know, what you applied for it, or what you claim for it? Uh, look, they had to find all the money, I suppose. But look, we got we got enough. I think, yeah. Okay. Certainly, we had that battle, and it's probably not something I want to put out too much in the public forum. But yeah, yeah it, it was a negotiation with the insurance company to to get to a final claim. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it's a and how about this police investigation? And it's completely now it's over, you know. There's no oh, yes, more. Yeah, it was, yeah, yeah, it was so, over, yeah. like, over within a year. Um, and just there, yeah, the final conclusion arson attack. Yeah. Um, other than uh, you mentioned, other than improving the communication part, it, do you think anything else would have done differently managing the crisis? Oh, certainly it would be about having an up to date crisis management plan. Um, so, you know, we wasted precious time in that first two weeks um, looking at sites that we thought could host us and, and historically would have been able to host us. Um, so I think if we had an up-to-date crisis management plan, then it's kind of that document that you just keep up to date once a year. And if you need to, you pull it off the shelf and open up the, you know, the right chapter. And if you look back, you know, four years from now, how, what's your feeling now running that that be rubber as a CEO? Yeah, look, it's it's the silver lining, really. And I think you've got to find the silver lining in any of this. Um, yeah. I look at what we've got now, and I was only just the other day looking through some photos of the old site. Now we've got we've got a brand new site. Um, you know, we've got new equipment as well. Um, you know, it's just state of the art, and it's chalk and cheese as to what we had. Um, back at the old site as well. We've got room to move, room to grow. Um, yeah, it really is a huge difference. So I think yeah. it's that silver lining as to you know, what we've achieved and where we are now. Fantastic, fantastic. So is, uh, you, for you, the market size export is dominant for you com compared to the domestic market for the Derby rubber? Yeah, so export's about 40% market for us. Okay. Export is 40%. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the, what kind of, let's, um, I want to touch a little bit on the, uh, uh, what is going on in Australia. Oh, okay, let me go back a little bit. Um, it, it's important that you get support from the local government, right? You know, we have the crisis time. What kind of support you got in, you know, during the crisis from the government side? Yeah, so the government, um, the government was, was quite proactive with us. Um, they gave us a small amount of money for uh, for some of the relocation costs um, to to bring us to a new state. 
Um, we also had support just through council. There's a lot that you need to uh, to do to get approvals to start up a manufacturing uh, site. Um, so a lot of that was fast tracked, upgrading power as well. So um, you know the state government were able to fast track that as well to upgrade the power so we could run the machines on the site that we chose. Um, so yes, there was support there. And there's we've got a very good relationship with the state government and with the local council as well. So um, you know we contribute to them around um, hosting them to come through the to come through the factory, sitting on their manufacturing forums to give direction to the state government about the state of manufacturing and, and where they can support us more. Um, so yeah, look, there was some, that support there, but it's a, it's a two way street for me. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I think that's a, a very inspiring but very tough journey. I know mm -hmm. it's a, I, I, you know the pain. Your management know the pain. Okay. From outsider, we see wow. Okay, how these guys, you know, as you mentioned, that they're supposed to be shut down plant and you know. And uh, move on, but uh, you made it. You guys together, management, you know, your employees together, and uh, with the customer support, uh, it's a very inspiring, uh, Michael. I'm glad that you know you gave shared this story today. Yeah. So I think it's good for the many uh, industries who if you have they have problems. Um, what to do, I know, how to get over with it. There are worse situations. I know people can solve their problems. You know, yeah. yeah. So. Okay, um, I want to go on to the uh, a more subject. You are not only just a CEO of the, you know, um, there be rubber, but you're actively involved with the rubber industry in, in Australia through the various organizations. So um, I, I want to touch a little bit on the, what is going on in Australia with reference to the rubber industry? Um, what kind mm -hmm. of uh, markets are growing? Um, how is the overall economy with the reference to the rubber industry? Sure, that's a pretty big set of questions. Um, look, yeah, I've been uh, I've been the chairman of the Australasian Plastics and Rubber Institute for the last uh, twelve years now, coming up to twelve years, and um, and I've seen a lot of changes in those times as well. Um, look, certainly our industry has shrunk uh, dramatically over that time, but look, it's it's kind of agglomerating as well so it's it's forming these companies that if they're forward thinking um, are going to be and are very successful as well so those that are taking some some strategic risks those that are investing in new plant those that are looking at new markets and new markets might be uh, space defense um, we've also have a, had a, a big change in in the market as well through COVID as well. So there was a huge disruption of supply chains uh, three years ago and um, and so we're seeing that there's been a lot of onshoring as well. So as all those borders closed and all the, as those shipping lines you know, dwindled, then it became very hard to source particular products. And so there was a lot of onshoring. So we, we saw that in Australia um, the, the, the products that had gone offshore had then came back onshore and a lot of sovereignty I suppose is the, is the buzzword that people are using. Um, now whether that's going to stay or whether we will forget about all of that in the next 12 months and, and go back to our, our previous models you know, remains to be seen. Um, so yeah I feel that it's it's certainly different, it's changed over those 10 years um, but um, yeah, those businesses that are not looking backwards and looking forwards, uh, I think are going to do quite well. Then, how about the you know? I think you, you, Australia is popular for the mining industry, right? And uh, so, how is the business for the rubber industry, guys, in, in, for the reference to the mining industry? Yeah, my, mining industry is still very strong. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, are there how many rubber companies are there in Australia? Uh, well, I say many, but it's probably not many on a on a, a global scale, and particularly not for you. But I think yeah. you know, there'd be probably around you know, thirty sort of uh, sort of in that small to medium size space. 
um, of the of the main players. And then we've got there's lots of sort of satellite and small players as well doing a little bit of molding, a little bit of hand building. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And you you already touched a little bit on the uh, Australian uh, Plastics and Rubber Institute. Um, I think that is also playing a key role. Um, in, I think you you are kind of promoter of educating, empowering them with the right uh, you know tools so that they are up to date and current. So, can you talk about the history of this um, APRI? Okay, and uh, you you just said you know 12 years being the chairman of the APRI, and uh, what kind of member? Uh, what kind of um, you have you have both? I think um, both plastics and rubber. Okay, so can you give us some insights about APRI, please? Yeah. Sure. So it was founded in Australia back in 1945. So it came out of the IRI, and that's the Institution of the Rubber Industry. Um, and th that was when it was sort of pioneered here in Australia. And one of the gentlemen who did that was uh, Mr. George Milne. Then. Um, and that was sort of bringing people together. It was around that, that the education piece as well. Um, and then in the 19, in 1992, we broke broke away from the UK, so we were still quite tied to the UK and into um, the Institute of Materials in the UK. So in 1992, we then formed the APRI as just a, you know, an Australasian um, branch, um, and it was about yeah, promoting the development of um, you know, the, predominantly the rubber industry um, and that science and technology. Um, they're having international speakers, um, speaker in the state coming together um, to hold technical seminars, coming together for social events as well. And you know, you, you have a busy schedule being a CEO of Derby Rubber and also having a chairman of this uh, API, right? How do you manage, man? <laughs> you know, it's all, everything is demanding. You know, you can't yeah. even it is APRI is a voluntary. You know, it's a honorary. But uh, you know, once you take the job, you you have to justify it, and it uh, it consumes time and uh, the resources too. Yeah. So how do you manage it? Yeah. Look, uh, it's a busy schedule, um, but I am very passionate about both. Um, so yeah, you know, the the hours aren't. Just a, a standard work week hours. Uh, you know they are sort of expanded hours, but you know I, I love doing what I do, and so you know I'm happy to put the hours in. Fantastic, you know, for the good of the industry, right? And also you enjoy the. So you want to see the positiveness in the industry. I think that uh, makes a difference. Yeah. Yes. Okay. And you got recently a new cap as a chairman of the international uh, rubber conference organization congratulations uh, thank uh, you for being the chairman yeah so um can we maybe for the audience to understand uh, you know better about the role of irco okay and the importance of irco for the growth of the industry uh, can you can you elaborate on now what you're going to make a change yes i think you have a how many years you're going to be the chairman or yeah, so I'll be executive chairman for the next three years. Um, okay. Yeah, just because I've got lots of spare time. Um, but no, I really wanted to. I really wanted to contribute. I, I've been part of Erco for um, for twelve years now, and um, I've been to twelve IRCs around the world, and um, and represented Australia at, with Erco. Now, we can go back a step. What is Erco? Um, yeah, you know, the, the International Rubber conference organization is uh, just under 20 member countries that come together so just like the APRI we have a we have a position on the international council and we um, we ensure that we're delivering very high class international rubber conferences on an annual basis and we have two conferences one is the international rubber conference or the IRCs and the other one is a uh, which has an exhibition attached to it, typically a three-day conference. And then we have a smaller one, which is uh, called the RubberCon, and that is typically a, a two-day conference only as well. And we hold each of those um, each of those annually. Um, I've just taken over from Professor Nordemir from the Netherlands. He had a, a six-year um, period of being the executive chairman, so he's left very big shoes to, to fill there. Um, and so I guess what I'm looking forward to the future is, is um, a, a bit of modernization, I guess, as well. 
uh, with how we how we come together as a council and, and how we we kind of sit behind the scenes of of the IRC is just making sure that the member countries are going to deliver a very high quality event. Um, something that we've brought in through um, through Professor Nordmier's term was the student awards. Um, so that's been a huge benefit to to students you know, studying PhDs um, to to come to these IRCs, present uh, papers and present posters and and uh, come back and away with, with a monetary award as well and recognition. Um, so a lot of investment into the students. And then I guess a bit of a I guess a bit of a plug for what's coming up as well. So we do have a Rubicon coming up in, in Edinburgh in May, uh, May 10, and we've also got the next IRC, which is going to be in Haikou in China, and that's on November 7 as well. Those those are the two events that we've got for 2023. Yeah. So I think you know, if somebody wants to host the IRC, they have to wait for the 10 years, you know, kind of, uh, right? <laughs> yeah, it, it is really um, um, uh, well re recognized rubber industry event. Even you have so many, you know, Technobis organize our own events of rubber industry, but I looked up to the IRC as the best technical uh, event uh, with the global research and both uh, is you get a chance to you get a chance to meet uh, uh, senior researchers technologists and also young the future generation of it i think that is a perfect blend and I, irc and, and yeah. also irc become also cultural brand ambassador i can say you know when you go to you're rotating from one country to other country uh, you know all these you know, i don't know how, how many countries each irc people participate yeah we're just 20, 20 20 countries around the table i mean we've, and we've got at that table there's api but there's you know, iom3 are there dkt's there iris their acs so you know, all the all the big names in in rubber technology are all around that table as well yeah 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 so I think the role of IRCO is very, very important for the growth and sustainability of the rubber tire industry. Like, you know, because the quality research is, I think you recognize quality research, you bring the quality people uh, to the event and exchange information so that you can pass on to the industry to utilize that uh, the, the research output. You know? so, yeah, fantastic. Mm -hmm. Right, congratulations, man. And uh, I'm sure I see more wonders under your um, uh, uh, chairmanship. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, I want to touch one more topic is on the uh, uh, research needs. I see rubber industry is evolving a lot. You know, you can't do the same thing like you know you used to do in the past. You know, you're talking about industrialization or the new materials, smart materials. You know, so uh, in your point of view as a you know industry person, um, what are the areas the in researchers should look into to develop? Not in, in the research point of view. Yeah. Sure. So I guess you know, first off, blocks is materials, um, and you now that's where the majority, I think, of the research is. Um, so novel materials, and um, you know, whether that's nano, you know, nano fillers or, or, or you know, particular process developments as well. Um, and then I guess sort of outside of the industry is about things that can support your business as well. So I touched briefly on industry four. So partnering with universities, and we certainly did that. We we partnered with the University of Adelaide and brought, a, uh, brought an intern into the business, uh, a postdoctoral um, you know, student into the business to, to develop an application for us. So you know, an app on a tablet, for digitising our work instructions on the shop floor, so you know, there's there's a lot more within the universities than just material development um, that you can tap into and bring those people into your business as well and get fresh new ideas. and And I think that comes back to what I said before. You know, the the businesses that are going to do well are the ones that are forward thinking and and looking at those future markets, future market trends. Um, you know, the, the, we, we are in a very traditional industry, but, you know, new machines, new technology, data, all of that is available to us now. And, you know, we should be, we should be grasping it and utilising, you know, the, the, taking hold of the benefits of that. Yeah, um, but I think, 
yeah, having dealt with universities in the past as well, I guess one tip is for businesses who want to approach universities, I'm very pro, you, you know, um, coupling up with with universities, but making sure that you've got a you've got a project or you've got an application and being very clear as to what your outcomes, the outcomes that you want for that as well. Um, you know, universities can get quite theoretical, I suppose, as well. And um, there's been a number of times where you're developing new materials and you're, you're wanting to do some trials and, uh, you know, they say, well, how, how much material do you need? And you're thinking, well, I'm going to extrude this. And so, you know, by the time I fill the barrel and then fill the head and then, you know, then we get into, you know, making product, it's going to be X amount of kilos. They're like, oh, you're talking in kilograms, are you not, not grams? So, you know, you have that understanding right up front about, you know, what the, what your expectations are from the project. And I think once you once you do that, universities are very keen to get on board with industry and and government is trying to support that more and more in Australia as well. Yeah. I mean, you, see, you mentioned very well that, you know, you've got to hand in hand with both industry and the universities to work together to find the real solutions, you know, uh, for the growth of the you know, industry. And uh, uh, do you think that industry should have their own laboratories too? Do you think so? Yeah. In terms I, of I think it's very important to have laboratories yeah, on site to be able to do in-house testing and particularly you know, quality testing, cure tracing, I mean, hardness, of course, you know, you stand and you stand and sweep. Um, and that's certainly what we do. But if, it, if there's anything more specialty than that, then have those relationships with, with the universities. Yeah, yeah, because you, know, you may not be able to get all the instruments in the world. It's so expensive anyway. But you're collaborating with the university because they may have uh, enough state funds uh, to, you know, to getting the right equipment for the you know, research work. It's a very important uh, industry, and uh, you know, the universities have to you know, hand in hand and do the work together for the benefit of the industry. Cool. Yeah. Well said, man. Well said. Um, I want to touch, um, you know, a little bit on the leadership. Okay, you've been a CEO, okay, um, for say eight years now, okay, involved with it as a managing management level. Mm -hmm. um, what is the meaning of leadership for you? Yeah, that's pretty big as well. So, I mean, look, it's, it's incredibly important to have good leaders within business. It's also incredibly important to have a team of good leaders and good support Know, to interconnect your leaders as well. We're not just have a single leader within a business and to always be looking at you know, that, those upcoming leaders. You know, we talk about looking at investing into your people and making sure who that next generation is as well within leaders in the business. So leaders are incredibly important. Um, strategic leadership as well. I, I talked about the strongest team that I've ever led was one that had the common purpose and um, of recovering from that fire and having that having that purpose having a very clear purpose um, you know the clear values makes it very simple then to set what your goals are and and I think if everyone if the business has got goals and the individuals within the business have got goals that you know channel up to that then you know we all we all we all enjoy coming to work every day because we we've got that sense of purpose we know why we're here we know why we're doing this job while we're making this product but you know, you must have come across so many CEOs, so many you know business leaders. So, um, have you ever you know observed that what kind of things you should not be doing? What they did, the kind of don't do's, you know, <laughs> you don't you call it don'ts, yeah, bad practices. Uh, what you know, some of the leaders they do. Can you pinpoint some of them? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I mean, the, the leader, the leader that can. I mean, I love walking the shop floor, and I do it. I do it every day. Uh, you know, I have to have to see the machines going, I have to see the products. But even, you know, my job is not on the shop floor anymore. Um, but I still have got to have that touch point. So, but the leader that goes out there and undermines, if I was to go out there and and shuffle production around or answer questions from the operators without going through my operations manager, then that's poor leadership. I'm undermining them. The leader that, and these are, these are examples of what I've seen um, within other businesses. You know, the leader that goes out there and you might have 20 years of experience in the rubber industry, but it's not for me to push someone out of the way and say, no, no, watch this, I can do your job better than you. Um, you know, it's all about instilling 
what I've learned and what other leaders within the business have learned onto onto our operators and and training and, and coaching, um, not belittling. Um, look, yeah, many examples of, of what I what I've seen. You know, another one is is just around dealing with customers as well and dealing with people. I said the you know, managing stakeholders is critical, um, and do that with integrity and do that with transparency and honesty and not tell them what they want to hear or what you think they want to hear or that their you know the the order is going to be fulfilled tomorrow when it clearly isn't but you're you're just sort of you know telling them that to to get them off your back um you know you do and we have that with our with our with our business you know we we uh, one of our values is say it do it own it you know it's that integrity piece yeah well said well said yeah you know, by, by the way, you know, in Australia, do you have a rubber technology programs uh, other than APRI? Uh, in universities, they do offer any degrees in uh, rubber technology? No, we don't. On the polymer, or maybe they have the polymer science or, or material science, do they? Yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah, more, so more focused on thermoplastics. Oh, okay, more on the plastic side. So I think the APRI plays an important role in educating them and powering them in, in the rubber industry, right? Yes. Okay, um, I want to touch um, a little bit on the, you know, the trends, the changes. I think that COVID they gave us, you know, fast track mode uh, button and uh, quickly get on to the digitalization, automation, and uh, in you know, so called a IoT industry 4.0. Uh, so, can you talk about your own experience on this angle of the digitalization? Yeah. You touched it in the beginning that you're doing it, so can you elaborate more on it? Mm, sure. I guess that we were ahead of the game when COVID hit because, um, you know, when we had the fire, um, we were prior to fire, we, you know, had the do what every business did back then. We had the, you know, your own internal server and, and um, you know, face to face meetings and things. When we had the fire, we very quickly went to the cloud. And that was back in 2019. And so, um, you know, we were used to having daily meetings on Teams and doing business virtually so that part when COVID hit when you know when all the lockdowns happened that was just what we'd been doing for two years prior already so that became very natural to us whereas a lot of other businesses had to learn that very quickly and and learn how to, to use those virtual platforms um so yeah that was that was something that we were ready for um so yeah, that's around sort of cloud systems, I suppose, really, really important into the future. Um, I've touched on data, the industrial internet of things, so connectivity, and uh, and we use a we use a platform called Tillit, um, which is uh, which allows us to overlay um, our um, our production data, so how many parts we're producing per hour. Um, it allows us to overlay so our traceability, so batch numbers of raw materials. Um, we've got um, IoT devices in our extruders and, and throughout the factory in the autoclaves and the like to take data off the machines and overlay that over the production data as well. And then it also prompts our, um, our operators to take quality measurements. So do they get a pop up? All right, measure a diameter, measure a length, enter that in, and the the, the uh, tablet is our go no go gauge on that, and and starts to keep a track of our of our quality as well. So those digitised systems where um, uh, we're gathering that amount of data off the shop floor, and then we're able to overlay that with artificial intelligence, so we know then the next time we do the job, how we did it. What our what our run rate was for producing parts. We've got that history embedded in there as well. Um, so that's all that's all readily available for you know small businesses like us. Whereas five years ago, that technology was was only around for the for the big players, and it was at a very expensive price point. Um, the next I guess is around cyber physical. So that's when you start to talk about uh, co-ops, um, and we're not at that point yet. But I certainly do see opportunities in our business for cobots um, and for AGVs. Um, so you know that's sort of certainly something that is on the horizon for us. Um, and then digitising. So yeah, taking your paper-based systems 
um, as soon as you're in the cloud, everything's digital, and you can you can push that information out to wherever it needs to be onto the shop floor, into administration, into ERP. So yeah, just being aware of what data you've got, where it's stored, and how you can you how you can push it across platforms. So yeah, I'm very passionate about industry four, and I see um, the you know, that's how people can can stay competitive and stay ahead of the game into the future. Yeah. So I'm suggesting that everybody must uh, make a changes with the way they run their businesses with the digitalization. So what is like a learning curve like? You know, it's not going to be easy, right? In the current, you know, you have traditional processes. Mm -hmm. Some are old machines, some are new machines. You know, and uh, and also the I mean, it's a comfort zone with the operate and you know, employees. Yeah, I've been doing this one comfortable, surely some changes. Yep. So, uh, what kind of uh, experience with your learning curve? Yeah, so move slowly. Um, yeah, you are going to get pushback. You're going to get resistance. And the worst thing you can do is try and do everything and have it all fall in a big heap. Um, and it will take you a long time then to to try and roll that out again and get buy-in. Um, so, look, yeah, you might have a, a, and I've listed off a long list of, of projects that you can implement within your business. But just pick one and and implement that. And then move on to the next one and move on to the next one, I think is the simplest way to do it. And the other tip would be, you know, with, with businesses, we've got data everywhere as our businesses have grown. You now we've got data in our ERP, we've got our, you know, our customers stored in a CRM, we've got our work instructions which tell us how to do a job, we've got our quality systems and the quality of data that we've got. We've got, you know, the batch, the batch quality information that we're getting out of our mixes. You know, we've got we've got data everywhere. Our formulas, you know, pricing. Just the list goes on of, of what kind of data we've got, and they're all sitting around in silos. And we're yeah. having to like take them from here and shove them over there. And in some cases, we then have duplicate sets of data, and we fall into traps where it updates somewhere and not in any other place. So, just drawing up a data map as well, yeah. and just saying, oh, where what have we got, and how do we want to push the data? You know, are there, where where can we? have maybe a central um, storage place for data, whether you want to have that in something like you know, SharePoint or you know, that in the Microsoft Cloud system or in AWS, and we want to do it. But look at you know, what data you've got, how you want to store it, and where you want to push it as well. And just make sure you have single sources of data is really key as well. And clearing up your data. We, we acquire a lot of rubbish data. So you know, cleaning all of that up, and and um, just holding what you need to hold. So yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of lessons we've learned the hard way along the way as well. Um, but yeah, certainly you know those are some tips that I, I would say are, are key. I think that also brings the you know okay there's a lot of trash in there. At the same time, the hidden treasure as well there. You know that was you missed. You know so. Uh, this brings you integrating all the tools and you know, the ERP or the CRM or, or quality and all put together and you get a better way of managing things right you know, so yeah. interesting yeah. I think that's you know you talked about you you're working with the Tillit yeah can you elaborate on that one and how they executed the project together with you I've seen the video I do like to have as part of this uh, session as well yeah Sure. Yeah. So till it, I, I outlined a few of the features um, just for around overlaying machine data, quality data, traceability, production data, um, and it's accessible. It's it's on a it's on a tablet. It works works in the cloud on AWS. It's just accessible via via URL, which means that it can be on my phone. It can be on my on my laptop. It can be on a tablet. Um, so it's very, very accessible and cheap to get into. You don't need to install computers around your factory, which used to be the old style of being able to tap into data and have dashboards and gather gather, uh, gather information. Um, yeah, one challenge that, that we gave to Newcon, and then Newcon's the, the company that that, um, uh, that has has the Tillet package, and that was that you know we're a we're a traditional manufacturing company as many rubber companies are and so yes we might have um, a, a control system running on an Allen Bradley you know, PLC or um, but you know we've got some old equipment too and how do we get information off of those pieces of equipment I'm not going to replace 
you know, an extruder just to be able to get data off of it. So we're actually able to tap into legacy equipment. So we've got a 20 year old, um, 20 year old extruder here, and we're actually able to tap into that and just by installing uh, a quite a cheap Raspberry Pi system into the back of it and, and pull bits of data out of the extruder and then push that, um, push that into a Wi-Fi access point and stream that into the office and then pump that to the cloud and then have that in dashboards. So I can, I can jump on my, my phone, on my tablet, and I can look at my extruder and see what RPMs it's running. I can see if the barrel's full, if the barrel's empty. Um, you know, I can see if we're having having difficulty with a touch back, a tough batch about what pressure we're generating the in the extruder, and we get and we're we're overlaying that with the with the job that we're running. So, yeah, it, it's extremely accessible, and not just for you know the latest tech. And is it, did you miss a lot in this one? In terms Sorry. of making a change, yeah, did you make a lot of investment into the you know, digitalization? You know, making changes with uh, all the you know uh, with the what kind of investment? Very, very accessible investment, and we're talking, we're talking Raspberry Pis, we're talking um, just a very, a couple of access points, wireless access points, you know, a few hours from technicians, so very, very accessible price point. Yeah, super, super. Uh, Michael, I can still continue on uh, various issues on the you know discussion on this, but maybe we can do some other time. Uh, but you know, I have uh, this um, uh, kind of request to all the, my guests uh, as a part of the final conversation, as part of the final part of the conversation, as you know, invite them to give us certain uh, good management practices uh, for the rubber industries. Uh, no, I, I think you have prepared a short presentation on it. So let's have sure. a short presentation on this uh, good management practices for the rubber industries. I think yeah, it would be, be good for the you know, owners to learn uh, made changes with their way of doing things. Yeah. Yeah, so I've got my I've got my top ten. Um, and yeah, the first one is about um, ensure that your risk management and your business continuity is is up to date. Um, so I've touched a lot on this already, and it wouldn't it would be remiss of me to not to put this as my number one after telling the the fire story as well. So just make sure that you're aware of what is going to disrupt your business, and then just manage those outcomes uh, accordingly as well. So I mean, an arson attack is one of the most extreme disruptions that you're going to have to your business, but it could be something as simple as a cyber attack. So making sure that you're you're aware of what might disrupt your business, and then how are you then going to manage that? <clears throat> um, look, I've, I talked about um, having our continuity planning out of date. I've got one customer um, and colleague here in in Adelaide who phones me up every year and just says, "Hi, Michael. You know, just doing my continuity planning. Do you still have that press? Um, is it still available for me to?" mold my product if I can't mold it in-house and just ticks that box and, and works down his um, his list of continuity planning. So that's, that's a great way to do it. Um, next one is to be on top of your compliance obligations. So we have a lot of compliance obligations in the rubber industry that could be around your, your ISO certifications. It might be around plant registrations, training, and of course, I can't not mention insurance. Um, Number three is about safety. So maintaining a safe workplace and promoting safe work practices. Look, we're in the rubber industry. The rubber industry does present us with hazards. We work in hot environments. It can be noisy. There's plant and machinery. There's, um, there's forklift traffic as well. So be safe, live it, uh, promote it, create a safe workplace, and then um, invest in, in your business and invest in people for, for training and maintaining that. The next one I've got is around building supply chain resilience. So it's been tough over the last three years, um, getting our hands on raw material, the pricing of raw materials. Uh, we certainly had to have some tough conversations with distributors to ensure that they were holding stock of our product because uh, we couldn't get containers, there were shipping delays, um, long lead times for, for shipping as well, as, as well. So it certainly wasn't smooth sailing. So look, there's still some disruption in supply chains. There's the war in Ukraine. Um, you know, China's going through um, the COVID crisis as well now as well. So 
is all that? Are we going to pop out of that and it's all going to be exactly the same as it was three years ago? Look, I very much doubt it. Um, I think that we do have to change um, the way that we look at our supply chains. Um, and so I've got a couple of tips around um, uh, how you might look at your supply chain. And that's uh, from a Professor Ruse, who's a Swedish academic who presented here in Adelaide. So looking, just saying, you know, procure now for production in mid-2023. It's no longer just in time, but just in case. Um, have actively be looking at alternative suppliers as well, or look at your, your supply chains, innovate based on um, what available supplies there are. We've found that over the last three years, certain materials haven't been available that were prior. And so we've had to adapt our processes, our formulas uh, based on what is available. Get your organisation and people to be mentally prepared as well. So create entrepreneurial mindsets, build that business resilience, build that business responsiveness as well to, to keep on top of all of this because it's it, supply chains are, are not simple anymore. And we do need to keep on top of that. We need to, do need to keep agile. Um, create a culture that is willing to learn and then uh, make sure you fail quickly and move on as well. My number five is about having a sustainability plan. And I've shown Darby Rubber's sustainability plan here. Look, it's incredibly important to, to build sustainability into your business strategy and to promote sustainability in your business as well. So you know, talk about the triple bottom line um, or the three P's, people, planet, profit. But you know, I, I talked about the three pillars that we have in Derby Rubber and how sustainability is, is core to our business. Um, market diversification as well. I showed the, the markets that Derby Rubber are in. You know, that builds resilience into your business around, around markets. I also talked about you know, my, my passion for rubber, being an engineer, about how it does span so many different industries. So look at look at who you're currently servicing and, and sort of the breakdown of, of customers and market segment and you know, look at whether you need to build some extra market resilience into your business. We've talked a lot about modernising the rubber industry as a traditional industry, but there are ways that we can, um, we can modernise um, our machines, about how we modernise um, our systems and our processes, and, and we can we can be a lot smarter in the way that we we manage our businesses. Number nine, uh, know your uniques. So, you know who are you and why do you exist? You know, I said Derby Rubber. We create resilient products so that you can go the distance. I, I, I spruiked our values as well. So, what are your businesses' uniques? What differentiates you from your competitors? Uh, we deliver value in a distinctive way. We're experienced, we're progressive. You know, we enable our customer success. You know, what are you doing that's different to the to competitors? And once you've worked that out, tell people about it as well. And then we get into that marketing piece. And we could have a whole other webinar on marketing. If you want to see what Darby Roberts do with marketing, have a look at our webpage and, and look at us on, on LinkedIn. And then my final one is, is about people. Uh, to invest in your people, invest in training, build a strong culture within your business, have those values um, embedded in your business, and then you'll, you'll be surprised at how that will then flow into your people, into how they deal with your customers, and into the quality of your products as well. So yeah, those are, those are my top 10. And if you'd like to connect with me and see what we are doing in our marketing, um, you, know, you can scan that QR code and that will then connect you with me on LinkedIn. Excellent, super, uh, well said, uh, you know, very important points. I think we put 10 top, top 10 points are really, you know, um, useful for the rubber industry people. Um, so we're almost close to the session, the end of the session, um, uh, Michael. Uh, but I still wanted to touch a little two more things before you go. I'm an Indian national. Okay, you're an Australian. You know, uh, I can I'm unable to resist to ask this going. question. <laughs> 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 so, uh, okay, fine. Um, we don't talk about what is your, you know, of course, one thing you want to have cricket, yeah, which is, uh, you know, we, we, we see Indians, we are... Uh, uh, look at the cricket, our cricket players, the demigods, you know, kind of, we, uh, it's into their inner blood. So in your case, uh, which team is the uh, your favourite team other than Australia? 
other than Australia. Yeah. Well, of course it's Australia, but other than Australia, um, look, I will I will toe a very diplomatic line, and I'll I'll say New Zealand. Okay. Okay, <laughs> okay your neighbour, yeah. Just across. Okay. The okay. okay, okay, yeah. And um, so what else you do other than you know you have any hobbies of your own other than the rubber, you know? Yeah. What else you do? How do you manage your life other than this influence yeah, of social so, media? I, yeah, like I, yeah, I love, I love, I love food. Love you know, cooking food and exploring uh, international food. Um, I love, I love wine as well. We we're so lucky to live in Adelaide uh, where we've got great wineries surrounding us. You know, the Barossa uh, is just up the road. The Adelaide Hills, Clare Valley, McLaren Vale. We've got such great wine in this area, and I do love the wine here. Um, and yeah, I like I like bike riding and um, and photography as well as a as a, a, a little hobby of mine too. Wow, cool! So there are a lot of relaxing activities are there for you. Cool, man. Yeah, and cooking, That's cooking, right. cooking is one of the best ones of relaxing. Yeah, right. Yes. Yeah. And also rubber guys, you know, being doing that, we do we do a lot of cooking with the information. So. Oh, great. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Um, Michael, thanks a lot. Uh, before I let you go, uh, could you give a final remarks to the audience, please? Sure. I mean, first of all, just to say, you know, thank you for inviting me today. It's been a, been a pleasure to present. Um, look, there's a lot, I guess, you know, closing, there's, a, there's a lot happening in our market. There's a lot, been a lot of disruption, a lot of soul searching, um, but a lot of success as well over the last few years. And I think if you're smart, that'll, that'll continue for business as well. Um, so I guess my very big tip um, to reinforce what I've, I've talked about over the last hour is just don't slip behind. Um, you know, don't don't look to the past for the answers for the future. And um, yeah, just keep keep investing, keep moving uh, with the times because the yeah, times are moving very quickly. Well, thanks a lot, Michael. If I see in point person, I do one hug for you, giving this uh, <laughs> session. Okay. Uh, uh, thank you very much uh, for being part of this session today. I really appreciate and uh, really inspiring story what you you know talked about, and there would be as well as also some of the advices you give for the you know industry people. Um, I, I'm I'm hoping to catch up with you in the future episodes and you know, some other topics, you know, uh, so that we continue to educate the industry. Yeah. Thanks again. Appreciate. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, guys, uh, that's the end of the session today with the journey of the Derby rubber based in Australia, the crisis to sustainable growth. We had a wonderful conversation with uh, Michael Clayton, the CEO of the Derby rubber. I'm really hoping that um, you find this session useful, you know, something that you can take back home and you know, make some changes the way you run your business. Um, thank you for being part of the rubber industry news server today. Thank you. I see you in the next episode. Bye-bye for now.